Half-Life 2 has a pretty big and diverse enemy variety. What if I was to tell you that there used to be a lot more though? This is the second and final part of the list of all cut characters of Half-Life 2, though it doesn't really matter in which order you watch them. In these two videos we're taking a look at all cut characters and enemies of Half-Life 2 that we know of. I will both explain all that is known about them and also theorize a bit as to how they would be implemented and why they were cut. To quickly address some people saying that my last video included some misinfo, this might be true in some cases actually. In case you didn't know, the only real trusted sources for Half-Life info are the common over wiki and the cutting room floor. For some things I use the Half-Life fandom wiki and this odd cut characters of Half-Life 2 wiki. Don't worry, I was pretty careful with this source though. A lot of my video was also of course speculation, which I did also state so. I did find like one or two tiny things that I stated as fact that were unconfirmed, so if you want to you can check out the description of the first part for some corrections. A lot of people are saying I got something wrong about the cremator, which I found to be weird. What could I possibly have gotten wrong about her? She's one of my favorite characters. However, if I do happen to say anything wrong in this video, I will put a correction in the description, so be sure to check it out after this video. Also for context, I hosted a cut character art competition on my Discord. In the top left corner, you'll always see who the shown image was made by or if it's official. This art was also submitted towards our competition including prize money. It's our community vote. The community vote is actually starting right now, right when this video released. The voting on the Discord has started and it will last for 3 days. So come join and vote for your favorite. Also, make sure to comment which of these cut characters is your favorite and why. Alright, let's get into it. IA Leifu was a protagonist concept designed by Ted Beckman, the same person that designed Mr. Friendly. It was a female human character wearing a helmet which would retract to reveal the face. She wore a full combat suit and was equipped with a handgun. She's also seen wearing a cross necklace in his concept art. It is not unlikely that this was planned to be the protagonist of Half-Life 2, or perhaps a very early concept art of Alex. It also looks very similar to the Assassins of Half-Life 1. The Hydra is another fan favorite. It was cut rather late into development, which means it's actually fully developed and we also have quite a bunch of footage that includes it. The Hydra was to be a massive colonial organism made out of three neon blue tentacles. Each tentacle was to end with a different head. Its entire body consisted of a transparent blue matter with its organs being clearly visible. The general design is similar to that of the tentacles of Half-Life 1. While looks-wise, it also seems to be inspired by the real-life Hydra, an invertebrate freshwater animal. You would see it in City 17, in the section between Alex's kidnapping and Barney's rescue from the sniper. There are a ton of maps that leak that include this enemy. A lot of them were recycled maps from the canal section. These levels were to be filled with a lot of Hydras. A very popular video shows how a common gets impaled by a Hydra right in front of Alex's and Gordon's eyes. The different heads of the Hydra were to have different capabilities. One of them was pointed, being able to pierce through its victims. The other's behaviors are unknown, but they both have specific names that help us make an educated guess. One of them is called Seer and one of them is called Smacker. The Seer was most likely to be some kind of sensor, either literally seeing or using its head to feel things. It does look like it has little sensors on its head. The smacker would most likely either smack at victims like a fist or grab them like a hand, which would explain its shape. It being cut is a bit of a sad story. The designer of it, Ken Birdwell, spent a lot of time coding this character and also designed areas of the game specifically to feature the Hydra. At first, other Valve employees didn't seem too fond of the concept. He kept his work secret until after a long while he decided to show it to others. They all loved it and urged him to finish it. Eventually they came to the realization though that while it looked great fighting against other NPCs or knocking stuff over, it was very unsatisfying in first person. The player would just be dead out of nowhere. Birdwell said that it was painful but that it had to be cut. He hopes that it will somehow return in the Half-Life and Portal universe. He suggested maybe rethinking its AI more along the lines of an antlion, which I'm not sure how that works, but whatever it takes to bring this character back, I'm here to support. The Sectic was to be a dog-sized macrovirus that looks like the real-world antlion lava. Fun fact, the Sectic was actually to be a creation of an alien warrior race. Not specifically the Combine. This enemy was planned before the Combine were. This unknown alien warrior race was to utilize weaponized alien creatures. The Sectics themselves would make clicking buzzing noises by bobbing their body up and down against the surface that they were attached to. Concept art shows insignia on the tick similar to the symbols we know from the Combine today. These markings were to symbolize their delivery vehicle and task group. Delivery vehicle referring to the fact that these enemies were to be shot using pods, which is a concept that is still in the game in the form of headcrab canisters we know today. Furthermore, similar to the headcrab canisters, they would be sent into enemy positions to weaken them before an assault. After they managed to feed off their victim, the sack on them would unfurl behind their legs and would be dragged by the tick. They would attack in numbers, usually feeding off of victims until they are fully out of blood. They would then use the blood to feed on and create more generations of ticks. This way a small amount of sack ticks could multiply in enemy bases and create an overwhelming number of individuals. A plan seen with them was supposed to be on the Borealis. Everyone who watched the last video will know that the Borealis crew was to be found dead. Most of these deaths were due to sack ticks. In a leaked sound file, Odell was to explain to Gordon that he has determined that the creatures are unable to survive in freezing temperatures and that he has thus shut off the Borealis generators in order to wipe most of them out. They were eventually cut because they hadn't shown themselves to be fun enough to preserve. 
this creature does not have a lot more known about it than this concept art. And it also has quite the interesting description. It was supposed to be some sort of hairy vagina on three legs. It was to move by hopping from point to point while trying to land on the victim's head. It would have some kind of fluid streaming from its mouth and was to appear as a three-pointed star when seen from above. It's not known for sure why this character was cut, most likely due to... I think you know. Though then again, they did include the gold mark in Half-Life 1, so who knows. Skitch is a female alien cut from Half-Life 2. The most interesting detail about it being the fact that it was supposed to be the pet of Alex Vance. Skitch was suggested at a time where Dog was only a rough idea and belonged to Eli Maxwell only who at this point also had no relation to Alex besides knowing her. Skitch was from an unknown species, and was to have long, hyperdermic teeth. Eventually, Skitch was merged with Lorak as Alex's pet, and Kleiner ended up as the character that owns a pet alien, Lamar. Johansson is mentioned by Odell in leaked sound files. He was to be the captain of the Borealis. He would have most likely been found dead on the Borealis alongside the rest of the crew. This character was cut alongside the Borealis chapter. Also known as a breeder, shock trooper and prowler, the common alien assassin was to have long claws used for slashing targets, red spikes on the top of its head, a breathing mask, pipes in its eye orbits and apparently only two toes. To simplify a bit, the alien assassin's coat eventually ended up being used for the fast zombie, which I think paints a picture a bit. It was however also planned to have the ability to run across tight ropes and to fire smoke to conceal itself. It was also equipped with weapons. It was to throw shock trip wires, knives and an unknown weapon named Pests that was stored on its back. This character was to be found frozen in the Borealis. Though most likely in a state where it wasn't yet captured by the Combine, as the name Breeder is often mentioned in the leaked map including it. There is also an argument to be made that the Combine alien assassin and cremator are somehow related, as both of them have the same orange sphere on the back of one hand. It's unknown what it means, but they both have it. This character was cut once it was decided to simplify the Combine units, its AI being reused to create the fast zombie as I've mentioned. The zombie assassin is the headcrab version of the common alien assassin. The model can be found in the leaked Half-Life 2 files. This enemy was made redundant once a fast zombie was created from the common alien assassin. I think this enemy could have fit nicely as a main antagonist in Ravenhorn, perhaps chasing the player a few times. If you want to see a mod nicely realize this concept, check out the Tropic Zero 2. These were seen in a lot of Zen levels. An opposing force, it can even be found in the Black Mesa research facility itself. It can also be found in Half-Life Alex. In Half-Life 2 it was also planned to be included. References to it can be found in the map files for the Endline Caves and for the sewers under Combine factories. I really would have loved some more Zen references in Half-Life 2. The Whistler is quite possibly the entry with the least amount of information. It's a character that only appears in a singular test map called Whistler. Your guess is as good as mine on this one. What is interesting to note though is that in the final game of Half-Life 2, we never get to witness anyone whistling at all. We did get it in the following episode though. I can't get this tune out of my head. Barney Scout is another weird one. He kinda looks like that one image of a person that a lot of people have seen in their dreams. Barney Scout is a rebel that was supposed to be seen in the beginning of the game. He was tasked by Barney to go and fight Gordon. While escorting Gordon to Barney, he was to be arrested. He would then be questioned and possibly tortured. We eventually only got to see a random citizen be questioned. I do find it interesting what this implies for the law of Half-Life 2. Gordon Freeman's arrival was not expected at Half-Life 2, as the G-Man simply put him out of stasis then and there. If Barney was to have a scout waiting for Gordon, this changes a whole lot about the story. Perhaps Gordon was put out of stasis way before the beginning of Half-Life 2. Perhaps some of you know more about the beta in this case than I do. This character was cut rather later to development, somewhere between 2002 and 3. The Combine Guard, not to be mistaken for the Combine Civil Protection Guard, was to be a part human, part synth enemy. It was the direct successor of the Combine Synth Elite Soldier, which the Combine Elite we know today also was inspired by. The Combine Guard was to be the next step that humans get transformed to after becoming Combine Soldiers, slowly becoming less and less human. It was to be at the Combine Guard Gun, a weapon that would fire a big disintegration beam, which was a concept that they reused for the Strider Cannon. The Combine Guard would also have a smaller weapon on his left wrist and would kick enemies if they got too close. The looks of it are pretty creepy. It's got somewhat of a human head left poking out of the big pieces of armor. It has no eyes though and some kind of breathing tube going through its mouth. The player would be able to throw the combine guard off balance by launching physics object at it. In this vulnerable state, the player would be able to use explosive damage on it to destroy its armor. Once all armor was destroyed, the combine guard would topple over and play a looping helpless animation indefinitely. The Wasteland Scanner was to be encountered in the Wastelands, notably in the Coast Chapter. They have no animations left over in the league. There are however models of pairs and trios of them which do have join animations which show two scanners connecting to one another, which would have looked similar to how birds and dolphins fluidly connect while flying and swimming respectively. Once a wasteland scanner got fired at, the group it was flying in would separate and they would fire grenades at the player. It's unknown why these were cut. Having a weaponized scanner sounds fun. 
early in the game's development, there was supposed to be a large air exchange that would slowly turn the Earth's air into poisonous gas. This forced everyone to wear gas masks, as well as hazard suits, an outfit very similar to those worn by Chernobyl liquidators. Once the idea of air exchange got cut, so got the gas masked citizens. This was apparently also done due to the citizens' expressions being difficult to read. Originally, there were supposed to be children seen in Half-Life. They would be working in common factories, notably the Cremator factory under the supervision of Metrocops. One particular map that they are featured in that I'd like to note is a singular test map made by Mark Nadler called CBCTV. This map consisted of seeing through a computer monitor, where you would see this. Very interesting. Eventually, absence of children was explained in law by the use of the suppression field. The child workers were a pretty dark concept, so I'm unsure what to think about them and them being cut. Let me know what you think in the comments. Nigel is another character with very little information. He was to appear in episode 2. The only map he's in is called Ep2 Outland 08 Chopper, in which his dialogue is conveyed through text. The console is a predecessor to Wallace Breen's character. Breen was originally known as the console instead of the administrator. The console was also a slightly different character, more similar to Big Brother of 1984. Posters of the console would be spread around every map. Propaganda was to be found everywhere. Eventually, in Eli Maxwell's lab, it would be revealed that the console actually only has its upper body left, the lower half beginning the process of becoming immortal through combined artificial life support technology. This is why we only ever saw him from the shoulder upwards in posters. The whole life support thing eventually came true with Breen and the Breen Grub. Which is canon, by the way, I don't care. Now, Court is an interesting one. The story of this character is also pretty confusing. So to start off, Planner was planned to be the Scientist 01 model, better known as Walter, turned into an actual character. The early concept for Kleiner was called Cord, without an H. Eventually, they found this guy who worked as an accountant in a firm above Valve's office. Once approached by Valve devs, he was glad to be the face of a Half-Life character as his kids were huge Half-Life fans. This guy just so happened to be called Ted Cord. It is unknown why this old model is called Cord with an H. But just to be clear, this character is not based on Ted Cord and is instead an early version of what ended up becoming Kleiner called Cord, without an H. So the model Cord, actually meant to be the early character called Cord, is simply Kleiner's original model, which eventually got replaced by the looks of Ted Cord, whose surname just so randomly happens to be the same as the old model. Mark Laidlaw actually has a funny anecdote about this. He once randomly saw Ted Cord at an airport, and in what was an all-stars aligning event, precisely where Mark Laidlaw stood, perfectly framed for his eyes only was a big hanging sign when he saw Ted Cord standing at the airport. Food court. Court, court, court. It was all there in that image. Absolutely objective, but also completely subjective, he says. If we'd run into each other a few feet in the other direction, I wouldn't have had this perfect view. This old model of Kleiner ended up being reused as a hostage model in Counter Strike Source. The gas flyer was to be a flocking creature able to use stun gas that comes from vents that are located on its back that would disable the player. Once the player was stunned, the creature would rush in with a fatal sting using its long tail. It was to have a translucent sack with visible feathery organs on its back. If you were to shoot the sack, it would come crashing down to the ground helplessly. They were to be seen in groups, tethering to dead prey like a hellish balloon. Everything we know about the sad barnacle today is a singular model. It is unknown what its behavior would have been. Perhaps it would simply be that of a regular barnacle. It's also only found in a singular unique map, Zoo Model. Zoo in game development usually referring to a level that shows off all variants of something, in this case models. As it is seen there oriented in the way it is also seen in this picture, it can be assumed that it was to actually be attached to the ground instead of the ceiling. What this implies for behavior though is unknown. Perhaps it would have been placed underwater and would pull the player down towards itself. Or maybe it would just be seen at the bottom of cliffs. With Alien Fauna, I'm grouping together a couple of enemies. Now, this decision is inspired by the Half-Life fan wiki, so please don't shoot me for this, but I think it makes sense. But yes, keep in mind, these are not all officially confirmed to be categorized under Alien Fauna. The first character is called Sewer Fauna. It was to be about 5 feet long, just enough to pin a human underneath its mouth. It was to have a thin, whippy tail and floppy pouches and a transparent membrane between its four front legs. It would only move by leaping from one point to another using its whole body as a spring. Overall, this creature seems to be inspired by the bull squid. Then there are two unnamed characters. The first one is this white tall creature. It was to have a smaller appendix that would waggle feverishly. The second one is this two-legged creature that was to have a red-like face and whiskers and a spiked tail. It was to be about five feet tall. If I had to guess, these probably would have been found in underground sections. Why these were cut is unknown, perhaps in an attempt to make the enemy variety not be too huge and thus confusing. The particle storm only exists in sound files. It is unknown where this phenomenon came from. In the leaked sound file, Eli Maxwell was to warn Gordon about them. You've never been out there before. I have one piece of advice. At the first flicker of green light, you run. 
First storm I saw, I made the mistake of stopping to study it. That's how I lost my leg. I've seen them take out whole squads, reeling in soldiers, tearing gunboats to bits. Some say it's only an electrical disturbance, but if you ask me, there's an intelligence in there somewhere. If only we could communicate with it. A force like that on our side. Now that would be a powerful ally. The Green Knight seemingly similar to that of the Resonance Cascade. So perhaps it was related to that. Also to note, in the final game, Eli lost his leg to a bullet script canonically. This enemy seems to be pretty powerful. Eli explains in a leaked sound file that he saw them taking down fleets of ships. Which is why Eli seemed hopeful that there may be an intelligence in it somewhere. It could have joined the resistance in fighting the combine. Elena Mossman is, you might have guessed it, the character that ended up becoming Judith Mossman. Her role in the beta was quite a bit different though. She was to be the director of the Kraken base, an underwater lab that was eventually reworked to be Black Mesa East in the retail game. She was however also planned to betray the resistance at this point in development, just like we eventually got in the retail game. Sound files show Alex Vance saying, let go of me bitch, referring to Mossman. Her look eventually got replaced once Michelle Forbes came in to voice Mossman, which painted the character as a lot more sympathetic and nuanced which was not what the original intentions were back when they were designing the model. The name was changed once Mark later considered Elena Mossman to be too close to a character of his book, The Third Force, A Novel of Gadget, a book he wrote before joining Valve. The character in that novel is called Elena Hausman, so Judith Mossman is what we got and what we know her as today. Also, she is often wrongfully referred to as Helena Mossman. This name is not correct. Listen to this leaked sound file and judge for yourself. I'm Elena Mossman. During the development of Half-Life 2, there was to originally be a few levels set in endline case between Eli Maxwell's lab and the coast, something that was later re-added in episode 2. As these were fully cut in Half-Life 2, so was this enemy. The endline king was to be a 60 foot tall creature encountered in these cut caves. According to Ted Beckman, they were aware that the Half-Life fans had grown up a bit in between Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2. They wanted to elicit a post Mr. Friendly response for the player. In an attempt to do this, they took one part so budget head structure, so similar what you see in large spiders, one part duff, and sprinkled on top of it a warty growth as a crown. This creature was supposed to be the highest in the end line hierarchy, similar to how ants have a queen. This concept was kinda brought back in episode 2 with the end line guardian. What a huge disappointment though when compared. Perhaps we'll see the end line king someday. The combine mobile mine will also be a tick-like creature, which makes them somewhat similar to tactics. It would be about 12 inches long and would, given its name, most likely explode once an enemy came near. Eventually, Half-Life 2 only featured mechanical mines such as the Hopper and Combine Laser Trip Mine. The Stalker in the beta was pretty similar to the one we know today, though the looks were noteworthily different. It was one of the earliest creatures to be put into Half-Life 2. According to Ted Beckman, the design of them was inspired by a black version of the Half-Life 1 skeleton multiplayer model. He proposed that it could be a black skeleton character that can hide in dark shadows and leap out at you as you got close. In raising the bar, it's seen not only wearing a blinder but also a muzzle, through which it was just about able to take in fluids. Stalkers were to be featured as enemies quite often, notably in the Air Exchange, Borealis and City 17 chapters. They were also to be seen assisting Elena Mossman in the underwater research base. The concept of fighting against them was fully cut out of Half-Life 2, then later re-added in Episode 1. They were also made slightly less scary looking in Retail Half-Life 2. The common assassin is the successor of the assassins of Half-Life 1. This character was similarly also supposed to be a woman. She would be quick, jump around and do flips, rolls and other movements. She also wears heel springs that improve her movement and speed. She has a red glowing eye that would slowly go out once she died. While she was cut from the final game, a lot of her model was recycled. Her head was reused for the common elite. Her heel springs were used as a base for the advanced knee replacements in Portal and Longford boots in Portal 2. The female comments that by Half-Life 2 Survivor, the arcade version of Half-Life 2 was also based on the common assassin with some slight changes. The original concept for Dork is known as T-Bot or T-Bot 1. This name stands for Travis Robot 1, which is named after Travis Brady, who is responsible for Dork's design, including the one we eventually got. This earlier T-Bot version looked quite a bit different if early concept art is anything to go by. While going through multiple iterations, he was essentially planned to be seen in the beginning train ride of the game would introduce himself to Gordon after he got placed there by the G-Man. Samuel would tell Gordon about the world of the Half-Life 2 beta, even giving him his own gas mask, who would then expand a bit of background info to the player. Like how people were being shuffled around cities in order to keep them confused. He also wonders why the train was randomly stopped in the middle of nowhere, which is seemingly where the G-Man placed Gordon on the train. The train introduction ended up being cut a lot, which also led to Samuel getting cut. Some of his lights do remain in the game though, in a sense. Lights like, I didn't see you get on, or no matter how many times I've been relocated, I never get used to it. These offer the player the same info that Samuel used to do via direct explaining. His face was later reused for Mail 5, which is the face used for Lastor, for example. The Gornark part itself is not a character, perhaps, 
It is closely tied to the Gornark in Half-Life 1 though. The Gornark was actually planned to return in Half-Life 2 in the form of the Combine Big Mama pod. Big Mama being another name for Gornark. It was gonna spawn huge quantities of headcrabs for using the birthing sack of the Gornark, similar to the cruel existence of stalkers. In this case, the Gornark would be forced to live only for birthing, not having any type of free movement, will or anything similar. Pretty nightmarish if you think about it too much. This device was to appear in Ravenholm, where it was apparently airdropped into the town, in which it then broke through a warehouse roof and ended in a cave at the bottom of a mineshaft. This area still remains in the game as you may know, even including the lots of headcrabs. The player was gonna use the digger, a cut vehicle of Half-Life, to destroy it. In a cut voice line of Father Grigori, she refers to the Gonark pod as the heart of evil. So I believe these were all the cut Half-Life 2 characters, including its episodes. Join the Discord if you haven't yet and follow me on Twitter. Let me know if you guys are interested in a cut Weapons of Half-Life video at some point in the future. So yeah, otherwise, thank you for watching. <laughs> Sky.